Hey everybody, um, we are going to continue reading in Things Not Seen by Andrew Clements. Last week we read chapters one through five. I read chapter one out loud to you and you read hopefully two through five by yourself. If you haven't read those yet, go on back, pause this, go back and read those before you read this because we're going to start on chapter six today and that's page 42 in the book. So we're going to go to page 42. 42, chapter six. That's what we're going to start with today. Make sure you look in Google Classroom. I put you some comprehension questions for chapters one through five, as well as Ms. Grissom made some math questions for you, and I put those on my Google Classroom as well. So be looking for all that. As always, I miss you guys so much, and I hope you're doing great. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and start reading so you can see the text, but I would recommend following along with the actual book, but you can do it however you choose. Okay, there we go. Chapter six. The cab ride to the hospital is something I want to forget. The cab driver didn't want to let me in his car. It was probably the sunglasses that scared him. Sunglasses after dark. I had to hold up the $20 bill so he could see it before he unlocked the doors. Turns out I should have been scared of him. The guy's probably a stunt driver for the movies. The kind they hire when they want six near misses every 15 seconds. I get out at the visitor's entrance, glad to be alive. Walking into a hospital isn't like walking into a library. At hospitals, people really look at you. And after dark in Chicago, the place is loaded with cops. And cops look at you extra hard. The lady at the visitor's desk has a giant hairdo, and she doesn't smile. My dark glasses bother her, too. I say, I need to see Emily Phillips. She got here this afternoon. The lady is chewing gum. You're going to be too warm in here wearing that hat and scarf, dear. I fake a cough and point at my throat, bad cold. She punches the key and then runs a long nailed finger down her computer screen. Are you a relative? Because Emily Phillips is still listed as a recent admit. If you're not a relative, you'll have to come back tomorrow. 5 to 8.30 p.m. And either way, you'll need permission from Dr. Fleming before you can see her. Oh. I'm not a relative. I'll have to come back. Then I turn around and walk out the door. Because I can't talk to the doctor, not now, I'm supposed to be at home asking an Ethel to come babysit. Besides, if I did talk to the doctor, I'd have to stay covered up with my scarf and gloves and sunglasses. Too strange. Part of me wants to give it up, go home. When that doctor called, she said they were fine. But doctors always say that. People die in hospitals, even after the doctor tells you they're fine. This thought gives me a chill that settles the pit of my stomach. Then, standing there outside the visitor's entrance, I see the sign pointing to the emergency room, and it hits me. That's where the ambulance brought mom and dad. I start walking, then pick up the pace until I'm almost running, because the ER must keep admittance records, right? I don't need some doctor's permission to see my folks. I just need information. The emergency room is at the far end of the building. Two fire department ambulances have their lights flashing, and two teams of nurses and doctors are scrambling to get some rolling stretchers through the big center doors. When I walk in through a side entrance, no one even glances at me. The smell, that hospital smell, it's much stronger here than it was in the reception lobby. It makes me want to turn around and get back in a cab, but I don't. What I need is a room number, but no one's going to give it to some kid wearing a hat and gloves and sunglasses. So I head down the hall and around a corner. It's quieter here. The rooms on either side of the hall have two beds each. White curtains hang from ceiling tracks. Some patients have them open. Others have curtains pulled around their beds. I pass eight rooms before there's an empty one. No one sees me duck inside and close the door to room 1007. I pull the curtains around both beds. The little bathroom has no luck on the door, no lock on the door, and there's a button to push if you need help. Like maybe if you run out of toilet paper. <laughs> That's funny because of what we're going through right now with the coronavirus and the toilet paper. No. Anyway, for the second time today, I take off all my clothes and wrap them in my coat. But there's no place in this bathroom to hide them. Out in the room, I pull back the curtain on the bed farthest from the door. I use my clothes to make a shape that looks like a person lying under the thin blanket. There's a clipboard chart with a ball point hanging on a hook at the end of the bed. So I write Christopher Carter in the space for the patient's name. That's the name of my science teacher. He smokes. In a week or two, 
he pro would probably be good for him. A few check marks and initials in the chart to make it look official. And then I'm out into the hallway. I stop and look around. I want to be sure I can find my way back to room 1007. The hospital is warmer than the library was. But the tile floor feels cold anyway. Then, when I go back through the doorway into the emergency area, there's a blast of arctic air because the big doors are open again. This is a bad place to be a spook. Too many people and they're moving around too fast. A noisy drunk weaving around with an ice pack over one eye and an orderly pushing a very pregnant lady in a wheelchair. A trotting nurse with a bag of blood in each hand. Three close calls in the first 20 seconds. All I need is two room numbers and I can get out of here. There's a counter off to the side. It's staffed by two young women, one at either end. The one wearing green is using a computer and the one in blue is talking on the phone. In the center of the counter, there's a clipboard. It's a form, time, patient name, insurer, admitting doctor, room number. I have to read upside down because clipboards are not supposed to twirl by themselves. The handwriting is rotten, but I see what I need. It's near the top of the sheet. 4.57 p.m., Emily Phillips, Blue Cross, Dr. Fleming, 5067. Room 5067, 5067, 5067. And right below is dad's name, but no room number, just post-op. So I'll start with 5067, fifth floor. It's much colder in the stairwell, but trotting up five floors gets me warm in a hurry. I wait inside the fifth floor door until my breathing is back under control. Naked, invisible boys are not allowed to gasp and wheeze. The only good thing about hospitals is there are signs all over. If you can read, it's impossible to get lost. Three hallways and two right turns, and I'm at the door of the room 5067. Looking in the window, it's a double and mom's in the bed on the left. Her curtain is half drawn, just enough to be a barrier between the beds. There are bandages and stuff on her face and it looks like she's asleep. I want you to notice the details that Andrew Clements is using right now when he's describing what it is that Bobby sees when he walks in that room. Because if we were the writers, we would have probably said something like, it was room 5067, mom was in a bed. There was somebody else there. So we need to make sure when we're writing, we try to mimic what we see as far as the details in, in, um, in what we saw right here. The more details we can give, the more visual our readers can be, and it makes the story better for them. There's an older woman in the other bed, also sleeping. Her bed is tilted up more than mom's. She's on her back with a pair of pale green tubes running from a clip under her nose to a panel on the wall. Slipping inside, I get to the far side of mom's bed. If the tube lady wakes up, she'll be able to imagine the boy she hears behind the curtain. Nothing scary about that. Up close, mom looks bad. There are dark bruises under both eyes, real shiners. An X made from two strips of clear tape is holding a white pad and some kind of brace on the bridge of her nose. Two butterfly bandages almost cover a small cut on her right cheek. And at the hairline above her left eyebrow, there's a purple lump the size of a golf ball. I look at her hair on the paper pillowcase. And among the brown, I see some gray ones. I never noticed that before. Her hands lie open on the pale blue blanket, palms up, fingers slightly curled. She has bruises on both arms. I feel as if, as if I've been punched in the stomach. I put my hand lightly on her shoulder. Mom, it's me. She stiffens and sucks in a quick breath. Her hands clench and her eyes jerk open, terrified. I pat her shoulder. Mom, it's all right. It's me, Bobby. I'm here. I, I came to see you. She reaches for the hand on her shoulder and I give it to her. Her head turns toward me and I can see her eyes now. Her pupils are wide and dark, scanning. Bobby, how? Her voice is cracking. I reach for a plastic cup on the bed stand beside her purse. Here, have some water, Mom. She lets go of my hand, drains the cup, gives it back, then holds her hand up until I take it again. I hear voices in the hall, but they pass the door and fade away. She's whispering, how did you get here? I've been going crazy with worry. Have they told you about your dad? 
The doctor called me at home, and I just bundled up and took a cab. They didn't want to let me come see you, but I ditched my clothes downstairs and came up anyway. So did you see Dad's arm? She nods, and it hurts her to move. His left arm was a mess, but the doctor says it looks worse than it is. Her eyes fill with tears. But what I'm most worried about is you. Bobby, we didn't mean to leave you alone. I mean, we did, but it wasn't like we were ignoring you or forgetting about you. I squeeze her hand. I know, Mom. I know. Her eyes keep trying to see me. This, this happening to you, Bobby, it was a shock for us, just like it was for, no warning. The door swings wide and three people walk in, led by a short woman in a white coat who's finishing a sentence. That's the greatest concern at this point. Miss Phillips, good. I'm glad you're keeping yourself awake, all bright and cheery. I drop to my knees and scoot under the high bed. From what I can see, it's two women and a man. I know the talker's voice. It's the lady who called me at home, Dr. Fleming. Mom says, has there been any, been any word about my husband? I can hear the strain in Mom's voice. She's worried these people are going to bump into me. The lady doctor has a kind voice. I knew you'd want to know about Mr. Phillips, so I have one of my interns call downstairs and check. Dr. Porter, the man is standing near the foot of the bed. He's wearing brown shoes. It would be so easy to tie those laces together. <laughs> he shifts his weight and clears his throat. Ahem. Well, the operating room nurse said that the surgeon was very happy with the way things went. Apparently, the force of the impact from the left caused a compound fracture, which means that the bone fragments... Yes, that's fine, Dr. Porter. Dr. Fleming cuts him off. All we need to know is that things went very well and that her husband is going to be right as rain before we know it. I think you can rest now, Mrs. Phillips. If your head starts hurting again, ring the nurse and someone will come right away. In the morning, we'll take another look at your nose. Now, don't worry about a thing. There's nothing to be afraid of. Is there anything else we can get for you? A pause. Then mom says, what we talked about earlier, about my son, Bobby. Well, I've heard from him, and his Aunt Ethel is going to be able to take care of him until I can go home. You've heard from him? Dr. Fleming is annoyed. I told everyone that you were not to be disturbed. Who brought you the message? Mom pauses again, but I'm probably the only one who notices it. No one brought a message. He called me himself. My cell phone is there in my purse. Ah, yes, now the doctor's voice is smiling. The cell phone. It's impossible to be out of touch these days, isn't it? Well, I'm glad that's settled. Your son was a little shook up when I called with the news, but he snapped right out of it. Sounded like a great kid. He's a wonderful boy. And thank you for calling him. You're very welcome. You've got enough to think about without worrying about your son. Now, you get a good rest, Mrs. Phillips, and I'll see you tomorrow. Like a drill team, three pairs of feet, turn and march out the door. I'm glad to stand up because the way I had scrunched up my legs under there was starting to make my toe hurt. I say, very smooth, Mom, about Aunt Ethel. Mom grins and then grimaces from the pain. It seemed like an easy way to get that issue settled. And I really do have my cell phone, so there's no excuse for you not keeping in touch with me. All the time, her eyes are searching the air for me. Her eyes get watery again, and she says, I can't get used to this. I hate not seeing your face. I haven't seen Mom all soft and weepy like this since my first trumpet recital back in Texas. She loves music. We both do. Dad listens and enjoys the sound waves, but Mom really hears the music. She waves her hand around, a motion that includes the room, the hospital, the whole day. It's like a bad dream. All of this, I nod in agreement, even though she can't see me. Tell me about it. Do you know where Daddy is? I should go see him too. Mom shakes her head. He's in no shape for company, Bobby. Probably won't even really be awake until tomorrow sometime. Then it's like somebody flipped a switch and the old mom is back giving orders. Hand me my purse. She opens it and digs out her billfold. She finds three $20 bills and holds them up for me. This is all I have with me, but it should be enough until I get home. I don't think they'll keep me here long. Also, there's plenty of food in the pantry because we just got a delivery on Saturday. Saturday, three days ago, a million years ago. There should be a line of calves down in the circle by the front entrance. Choose the nicest taxi, Bobby, one of those big ones, and go right home, and be sure to set the alarm the minute you're there, all right? While she talks, I'm rolling the bills into a tight cylinder, and Mom's watching me. I close my hand around the cash, and it disappears, ready to be carried away. 
I open my fingers and the money roll reappears. Mom's eyes follow the floating dollars as she keeps talking. I hate you being home by yourself, but there's nothing we can do about it. And tomorrow I'll have your dad call you if he can. And you can call me if there's any problem or if you just want to talk, okay? Yep, I'll be fine. I don't sound very sure about that and I don't want her to worry. So right away I say, but like dad said, there has to be some reason this happened, something that caused it. I know we can figure it out or maybe we could just open a circus and get really rich. That makes her smile. And again, I remember that smiling hurts her. Seriously, mom, I'm all right. And I'll call you when I get home, okay? She nods and holds up her right hand for me. And I take hold of it. Now, give me a kiss if you can find the spot that's not bruised. And I do. And then I'll let go of her hand. See you, mom. I'll be home in just a few days, Bobby. I've got the door open now. The old woman in the other bed is wide awake. Her tubes flop around as she looks from the door to the curtain around mom's bed and then back to the door. She's confused and she has a right to be. Mom is looking at the door too, leaning forward as I start to leave. And Bobby? Yeah. Thanks for coming. Sure thing, Mom. Bye. Chapter 7. First night. Working my way back to room 1007, getting into my clothes again, walking around to the front of the hospital, finding a nice big cab, just like my mommy told me to, and then riding home. All that happens without a hitch, except my toe starts throbbing again. Coming home to an empty house. I mean, I've done it plenty of times, but tonight it's different. Alone is one thing. Alone at night, all night, and that's something else. Dad has some timers rigged up, so a few lights are on. Still, the place looks like a big old funeral home. This kid at school named Russell, his dad runs a funeral home on Kenwood. His family lives in the second and third floor of the place. At lunch, one day Russell tells me they've got a big cooler down in the basement next to the room where his dad gets the bodies ready. He says sometimes they have three or four corpses in the cooler at the same time. And then Jim Weinrob says that when he slept over at Russell's once, they sneaked down to the basement in the middle of the night and looked at a dead woman. After I heard that, I didn't eat lunch with Russell for a month. Stuff like that creeps me out. I didn't go in the front door of my house because the front porch has a light that goes on whenever anyone walks up the steps. If I go in that way, I'm almost sure Mrs. Trent would see me. She lives next door and she sits in her big bay window all day and most of the night. She would see me and she would probably waddle over to tell me that the police were here earlier. Mrs. Trent is the nosiest woman on the planet. And it doesn't help that buildings in my neighborhood are only about 15 feet apart. I let myself in at the driveway door on the east side of the house, the side away from Mrs. Trent. This side faces a big duplex apartment house. It's loaded with college kids. Their place is all lit up and somebody's music system is blasting away. I wish I was going there for the night. First, before I set the alarm system by the back door, before I turn on any other lights, before I even take off my coat and scarf, I go around and shut all the shades and curtains. If Mrs. Trent gets one good look at my empty clothes walking around the house, it'll mean the end of life as we know it. With the alarm set and my coat and stuff dumped by the back door, it's time to eat. I'm starved again. I watch as I feel my hands throw a peanut butter and jelly sandwich together, and I think how I'd give anything for a double cheeseburger right now. Then this thought, unless things change, my fast food days are over unless someone else does the buying. I'm great. I can't even get a happy meal unless my daddy or mommy buys it for me. Mom! I grab the kitchen phone and I grab a paper towel to wipe the strawberry jelly off it. I promised mom I'd call when I got home. One ring, two ring, three rings. Maybe she's already asleep or in the bathroom. Four rings. It's a deep purse. Ringer's probably set on low. Five rings. Six rings. Dead? Bad word. I mean the battery in her phone. Dead battery. Then it goes to voicemail. I try not to sound worried about her, but I am. Mom, Mom, it's me. I got home fine, and now I'm fixing some food. It's about nine, I guess. So say hi to Dad, and I'll call you tomorrow. Or you can call me. Bye. I've been at home by myself plenty of times, tons of times, but not like this. Never with both my folks away all night and no one else coming. I don't like scary movies, especially the kind where people are alone in a big old house. And I've always been a little afraid of the dark, which is not a bad way to be in this part of Chicago. Even with the cops and the university police all over, there's still plenty to worry about after sundown. 
The street lights are on, but there are shadows, lots of shadows. So I turn on more lights. In the TV, in the TV room, I set up a tray table. And then I get some milk in my sandwich. I should know better than to just turn on the tube. It's still set to WGN, and it's a movie preview. The one where Jack Nicholson is holding the axe and trying to push his face through a door. I punch the changer, and it flips to Cinemax. Some teenage vampires are having a meal. I turn off the set. But then the house feels too quiet, and bad pictures are bouncing around in my head. All three lamps are on, but it still feels dark. So I grab the other remote, and I turn on the FM. The room fills up with jazz. I concentrate on the trumpet line because that's my instrument. The trumpet breaks into a high solo, and it's a bright sound, shiny and clean. And then I remember my sandwich. I eat it, but it doesn't feel right in my mouth. It doesn't feel right when I swallow, and the milk tastes strange. Nothing feels right. Because when fear begins to crawl, it just keeps coming. Light is good. Light is very good. But the windows behind all the curtains are dark. And behind every curtain, there's a horror story, a real one. It's the real ones that come crawling at me through the night. The alarm system is blinking. That's supposed to make me feel safe. It's blinking next to every door. The alarm system has eyes and fingers all over the house. It senses things. The system will shriek when something outside starts to come through a door or a window. But fear doesn't need doors and windows. It works from the inside. I hurry to the study, flipping on other lights as I go. I swivel the big computer monitor around so I can see it and not have my back toward the doorway or the big curtained window. The jazz keeps coming from the TV room, but it's a different tune now and a saxophone starts wailing. Sorry about that. The computer boots up and then I'm online and I've got a messenger window open. And I tap in Kenny Temple's screen name, Gandalf 375. Kenny's a Tolkien freak, which is why we're sort of friends. So this would be good. I can talk to Kenny online, just talk a little, like about jazz band, because jazz band practice today after school without me. No response. I key his name again. Nothing. I try a few other names. Kids, I ask about homework sometimes, like Jeff. I could ask Jeff what I missed in biology today. Or maybe Ellen Beck. She lives over on Blackstone, practically a neighbor. She'll know. Then I can ask her about English, too. Nobody's online. Then I remember midterms are coming. Nobody's online. A digit changes on the clock at the upper corner of the computer screen. It's now 9-11. I shut the box down. The hard drive winds to a stop. The screen gives a static crackle and goes to dark. And it hits me that it's so early. Eight, maybe nine more hours before dawn. The lights are burning here, but darkness is all around me. In the alley, in the attic, in the basement, in every closet. The night is everywhere. Hours and hours and hours of night. I'm sitting at the desk in the study, and I see my clothes reflected there in the dark computer screen. If I could see my eyes there were there where my face should be, what would they look like right now? Would they look uneasy? More than that, maybe haunted. Would my eyes look haunted? Were that lady's eyes open, the eyes of the dead lady down in the basement cooler at Russell's house? What did her eyes look like? I'm running up the front stairs, flipping on the lights as I go, and I get to my room and turn on the lights, and I shut the door, and I lock the door, and I sit on my bed, and I grab my pillow, and I hug it against my stomach because of the fear. It is cranked up. It's pa up past terror, past panic. I'm thinking this must be dread, except I'm not thinking. There's no room for thinking, just feeling. Feeling like the dread is oozing up through the cracks between the boards on my floor, Bubbling up through the heater grates, I can feel it rising like water, like black blood, like the fluids, like the fluids, 
the fluids that Russell's dad pumps into the dead bodies down in the basement of the funeral home. The dread is feeling my locked room in my mouth and my nose and my ears and my eyes and my lungs, and I'm drowning in it. I want you to read that paragraph again by yourself sometime and think about all the imagery that Andrew Clements just gave you. All he was telling is that he was scared because he was home alone, but he used so many awesome details to describe how that fear felt. It was a really, really great description of imagery right there. I'm even going to highlight it for you. Love that. But I sit there and I don't. I don't drown. I'm breathing so fast. I feel faint. I have to yawn, but I'm getting a thought. It's a real thought, a memory about fear. And I'm thinking it. And the thought is simple. It's simple. Nothing to fear but fear itself. From a history class. Just words until now. Okay, once again, this author is using something that we've talked about this year. Um, right here, look at how many times they're saying thought. So here's thought. Thinking it, another version of thought. Thought. So they used it three different times. What's that called? Repetition, right. And why do authors use repetition? To add emphasis. So when you're scared, one of the worst things you can do is just sit there and think about it. All the ways that you're scared and all the things that could happen. And so he's sitting there thinking and thinking and thinking and just making himself more and more scared. And then it's like I'm five feet away and I'm looking at me at this guy sitting on a bed and I can see he's not under attack. There is no danger. And I can see that the fear is the thing. It's just fear. Another memory, another thought. I'm walking out of the library about a year ago behind two college girls. And one of them says, I'm so upset. I'm just so upset. And the thing that upsets me the most is that I'm upset. Repetition. That's what she says. And I listen to this and I think, how stupid is that? If you don't want to be so upset, just stop being upset. And now it's the fear. It's the same. Like being upset because you're upset, it keeps feeding itself. And then it gets you to feed it. And you just have to stop it. Have to stop it. I stand up and toss my pillow back onto the bed. I take deep breaths. I go over to my dresser and look in the mirror. I wonder what my hair looks like. So I grab a comb and pull it across my head, patting my hair with the other hand. Feels right. It's Bobby, the well-groomed spook. What a clear complexion he has. Then I walk over and unlock my bedroom door and I go downstairs. I shut off the radio and I take my dishes from the TV room back to the kitchen. And I scoop myself a bowl of chocolate chip ice cream. I go back to the couch and I pull the blue fleece blanket around me and I turn on Nick at night. It's I Love Lucy and it's funny. I start laughing and I'm eating ice cream and not afraid. Still, when I finally go upstairs, I lock my bedroom door again and I sleep with my lights on. I mean, I know I can get past the fear. I just did it, but I don't kid myself. The boogeyman isn't really dead. Not forever. He's just not here. Not tonight. Let's see. I'm just going to check real quick and see how long chapter eight is. Sorry. Okay, we're going to go ahead and read chapter 18, because I know you guys miss hearing my voice. <laughs> chapter 8, my life. Wake up, shower, eat, read, talk to mom, watch TV, talk to mom, eat, nap, listen to jazz, read, talk to dad, watch TV, go online, talk to mom, eat, practice my trumpet, worry, watch TV, read, talk to mom, nap. So that's Wednesday. My second thrilling day is Bobby the missing person. It's weird not having anybody around. It makes it so easy to think. Too easy. Because unless the tube is on or there's music playing, it's just me thinking until mom calls again and again. When she calls in the morning, she wants me to tell her everything I'm doing, like every second. Starting with the cab ride home from the hospital last night. 
and she hopes that I remembered to turn on the alarm system. And why didn't I call her? Which I did, but she was too messed up to remember to turn the phone on. And have I remembered to water the plants? Because the ivy in the front hall needs a half cup of water every other day or it droops. And did I do my homework? What do I mean I couldn't get the assignment? So if no one is online, then you just call them on the telephone. Have kids today forgotten how to use the telephone? What do I mean that I didn't want to talk to anyone last night? Am I feeling all right? Am I eating nutritious foods? I'm not just eating junk, am I? Because that's the worst thing for my complexion. 15 minutes of that and I'm ready to scream and yank the phone out of the wall. The only good thing is that she doesn't have a charger there in the hospital. I'm guessing the batteries on her cell phone give up pretty soon. But then she'll just get a regular phone to put in her room. So there's no escape. I'm missing the old mom who would show up once or twice a day, give an order, and then get on with her busy life. Suddenly, it seems like I'm her life. Dad sounds all right when he calls me about noon, and I'm glad because I need Dad's help. I mean, like, what if the accident had messed up his head? But that clearly has not happened because first he explains exactly how he's hurt. Exactly. Like he's been the surgeon himself, or like he was awake the whole time taking notes. Then he tells me how he's thinking about my situation. I can tell there's another person in the room with him because he's not being specific. He says, regarding your um, situation, Bobby, I've been running through some possible cause scenarios. Possible cause scenarios. That's vintage, Dad. He says, the second I get out of here, I'd like to run some tests at the lab. Maybe put a sliver of your fingernail under the electron microscope. Maybe try to get a reading from a spectrometer, things like that. Plus, there are dozens of very fine papers in the journals of the past 10 years. Things about light and energy, subatomic refraction ideas that could give us some good science as a starting point. You know, so we can generate a theory about what's going on here. Sound good? I say, yeah, I guess. But then I say, how come we don't just do detective work? Because it could have been anything that caused this, right? Like maybe I ate a chunk of errated irradiated beef at the school cafeteria, or maybe we live too close to some big power lines down in Texas, or maybe I inherited something from you because you're the one who's been smashing atoms for 20 years. Shouldn't we start looking for clues? Because I've been thinking too. Dad's not the only guy in the world with the brain. Dad says, yes, drawing out the word while his gears are turning. You've got some good points there. But we have to start somewhere. And for me, that means finding a theory. Who's surprised? With Dad, it all gets back to theory. That's what he says all day long. He theorizes. Has he ever actually even seen one of those atoms he studies year after year? No. He looks at made-up pictures of things that are invisible and comes up with theories. I don't want theories. I need some action. I'm not saying anything. And it's too long a pause. So Dad starts talking again. Maybe you could go online this afternoon, Bobby. You could go to the website of the journal Science and do some poking around. Search their database for articles on life. Do some reading, okay? I don't want to argue with an invalid, so I say, yeah, I'll check it out. But when we hang up, I turn on the tube and tune in to a John Wayne festival on AMC because the John Wayne movie is almost perfect cure for dad's kind of thinking. With John Wayne, it's all about action. My big event for Wednesday is when Mrs. Trent comes to the front door about 2 o'clock, just as Duke is revving up his war wagon. The doorbell rings, and I trot to the front hall. I can tell it's her. She makes a very wide shadow on the frosted glass. She rings a second time, and I make my voice sound kind of weak, and I call out, Hello? Who's there? Bobby, it's Mrs. Trent from next door. I heard about your parents. You poor dear, are you all alone in that big old place? I saw the lights come on last night, so I thought you must be there. But I didn't see you leave for school this morning, so I've been worried about you. And I thought I would bring over some cookies. It's the old get your foot in the door with cookies trick. She really does bake amazing cookies. With Mrs. Trent, sometimes it's cookies, sometimes it's a question about how to make her VCR work, or maybe it's a piece of her junk mail that got delivered to her house. Anything will do. And once Mrs. Trent gets into the front hall, it takes at least 20 minutes to get her out again. I'm not sure what to say, but I guess I have to go with mom told the hospital. So I say, my great aunt Ethel is staying with me 
till my folks come home. She came late last night, and I'm at home because I've got the flu. And Aunt Ethel told me to come to the door because she's in the bathtub. But I shouldn't open the door because of the flu and because it's cold. Sounds lame to me, probably to Mrs. Trent too. But all she says through the door is, well, that's fine. I just wanted to be sure you were all right, Bobby. So I'll leave the cookies here on the porch and your aunt can fetch them inside a little later. Now you run along and get back into bed. Okay, thanks a lot, Mrs. Trent. And I talked with my mom and dad today and they're both doing fine. But she's already down the steps and waddling across the brown grass on her tiny front lawn. I peek through the glass and I can see that she's put the cookies down about five feet from the door. That's because Mrs. Trent is smarter than she looks. Plus, she has a big nose. With the cookies that far out on the porch, Mrs. Trent can sit in her front window and get a sideways look at whoever comes out to retrieve them. She wants to have a gander at Aunt Ethel. About ten minutes later, Mrs. Trent sees the storm door swing open on her front porch. Then, the short, plump person with stooped shoulders wearing a long pink terry cloth robe and fuzzy blue slippers shuffles out to the cookies, bends down slowly, picks up the plate, turns around, and shuffles back to the door. Mrs. Trent doesn't get a good look at Aunt Ethel for three reasons. First, the collar on the pink robe is turned up. Second, there's a bath towel wrapped around her head. And third, the real Aunt Ethel is about 1,200 miles southeast of here. And as a reward for my first major acting role, I have a whole plate of chocolate chip macadamia nut cookies to myself. They're gone by the end of the third John Wayne movie. But apart from my big performance on the front porch, Wednesday is mostly boring. But I don't get scared at all at Wednesday night. And then it's Thursday. Wake up, shower, eat, worry, watch TV, talk to mom, worry, watch TV, worry, talk to dad, read, worry, eat, worry, read, worry, talk to dad, worry, talk to mom, mom, worry, listen to jazz, talk to mom, worry, 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 nap. I even worried during my nap. So Thursday's pretty much like Wednesday, only worse. Besides the worry, it's worse because it's a beautiful day outside. One of those trick days near the end of February in Chicago when it feels like spring, except you know there's going to be six or eight more weeks of cold and snow and sleet. But a day like this actually makes you want to go outside and throw a frisbee or something. And it's worse because mom and dad are doing a lot better. And they feel that they have to call me all the time now, which is something new for them. And it's worse because I'm starting to see what's happening to my life because it's not like I wanted this. It's not like I'm some mad scientist who planned and studied and dreamed about becoming invisible all his life. And now it's happened. So now I can use my powers to take over the world, but it's not like that. Not when it's really happening. And I can just hear some guys at my school talking about this. They'd go, whoa, you're invisible. And you're bummed about it. Like, what's your problem? Go with the flow, dude. Check out the girls' locker room. Check out the jewelry store. Go to the bank and learn some codes, man. Go work for the CIA. You know, like James Bond, only better. Invisible. That's so cool. Because if that's what some kid is thinking, that's because it's not happening to him. He's not facing it all day and all night. What it really means. This isn't a movie where you watch it for two hours and then it ends. And then you climb into a car and you talk about the movie. How the movie was while you go get pizza with some friends. This isn't like that. This is my life. And what's happening means that suddenly my life is completely off track. It's like a train wreck and I'm pinned down, trapped, and it's starting to feel like this is permanent. What if I never change back to the way I was? What then? Do I have to keep it a secret forever? Like a spy who can never tell his wife and kids who he really is? Ha! Huh, what wife and kids? Right now it feels like I'm never going to get to be on my own. Like never even get my driver's license or go away to college. Never buy a car or get a job or have my own apartment. Never. And how would I live? And where? Am I going to have to stay in this house with my parents? Forever? I'm packed. I'm pacing back and forth between the kitchen and the TV room, back and forth, and my whole life is on hold. I'm waiting for something to happen. I'm waiting for mom to come home and dad to think, and Mrs. Trent to bake more cookies, and the school to call, and the sun to go down, and the sun to come up again tomorrow, 
It's like my life is supposed to be playing, but the VCR is on pause and the screen is blank and maybe the whole rest of the tape is erased. So I go down the steps from the kitchen and out the side door. That's the door away from Mrs. Trent's house. I turn off the alarm and I peel off my clothes, all of them. I take the key out of my jeans pocket and I go outside and tuck it inside the drain pipe beside the steps. And I go around the front corner of the house and walk west, right past Mrs. Trent's window. The weatherman said it was going to be unseasonably warm. And for once, it was the truth. It's about 65 degrees. So it feels like when the air conditioner is up on high, I can bear it. So I'm going for a walk today, right now, in the sunshine, because I can, because I want to, because I'm not going to just sit around and wait for stuff to happen anymore. I'm still me, and I still have a life. It's a weird life, but it's still mine. It's still mine. And that is the end of chapter eight of Things Not Seen. Love you guys. Enjoy the next two chapters. Wave at them.